Yay, we're live. It is 724. I'm a little bit late. Today we're going to talk about, or tonight, we're going to talk about big block Chevy dyno testing. I got some dyno results for you guys. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I want to talk about a couple things. I, this In this particular test, this was the um, Boneyard Boost one that I did with the Gen 6 big block Chevy. So we put a couple things in it. We, we tried different camshafts. We tried different cylinder heads. Tried a blower. Had, had an intercooler. And the cool thing about the intercore is that we ran it when we had already had a blow through carburetor application. We had our CSU blow through carburetor on there. So really lots of good stuff on there. I think I also ran nitrous on this motor, but we didn't include it in that particular video and that particular test that I did. I think I wrote that for a magazine story as well. But so let's go. <laughs> let's jump right in and get to some dyno results on the test on a big black Chevy with a Vortec, a Vortec supercharger. And an intercooled version as well. And like I said, we ran it with a carbureted blow-through deal and did, did the thing really need an intercooler. We talked about that the uh, earlier today or the other day um, on whether or not we should use an intercooler on low boost things. And then should we use it on, you know, on a blow-through application that kind of already has intercooling. We, we get a, a lot of change in charge temperature by blowing through the carburetor. And we lower the charge temperature a lot. We know we often get condensation. In fact, on the on the intake manifold, especially the aluminum ones, when we're blowing through a carburetor, it gets that cold. <laughs> so th that does work well, but that doesn't mean that you don't get additional power from putting an intercooler on this. And I can remember having this argument with people all the time. Oh, you don't need a you don't need a intercooler with a blow through carburetor. It does enough. I'm like, well, it's it still adds power. No, no, it doesn't. It doesn't. I said, no, no, it does. I, I, I know because I've tested it. I, I don't think that it does. I, I, I'm certain that it does because the dyno results and the data show that that actually happens. And that's that's a big difference between you got to be careful of who you're having that conversation with because they'll be very adamant about the thing that they're trying to tell you is true, but with no data to support that. Well, wh where is the data that shows that that it makes the same power? But at any rate, we started off with a Gen 6 454 from the wrecking yard, the way that I normally run them. And what we do is take off the fuel injection stuff, put on a carbureted dual plane intake manifold, the carburetor 650 or something or 750. 650 drives the big block guys insane because that we all know that a 650 carburetor is too small for a big block Chevy, despite the fact that the big, big block Chevy is only making 375 horsepower. <laughs> so uh, you could put a 750 on there as well, and and that's just fine. But we the, they make 375 horsepower and 480 or something foot pounds of torque, depending on how how good the motor is, how well they're running. And we did uh, like we normally do, put a camshaft in it. I think this one was a 284 camshaft, 276, all of those kind of in that range. This one made four 427 horsepower, so we picked up about 50 horsepower from the camshaft. Uh, peak torque was 475 foot pounds. So it didn't change dramatically. The peak kind of shifted it over a little bit, a few hundred RPM, but things really got interesting when we added the supercharger. So we added a vortex supercharger with cog pulley. So no slippage. And that was very nice. The blower was a YSI. So capable of a thousand horsepower. And we ran, it, it was showing, the dyno was showing, 19 pounds of boost. I honestly don't think it was that high. I think that this is when the 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 pressure reading um, was not accurate. I, I don't I don't think the boost pressure. I mean, the rest of the dyno is, is accurate, but I think that the signal, the sensor going to the the gauge for the dyno, I don't think it was accurate. I don't think it made 19 pounds. But at any rate, it it increased the power output from 427 horsepower to 791 horsepower and 712 foot pounds of torque. So it did, it made good power. And that was, that was non-intercooled. That was blowing through an 850 CSU carburetor with their, with the CSU bonnet on top of the carburetor. So Vortec short section of discharge tube going into the bonnet and into that 850 carburetor into the same intake manifold. Although I think we had a spacer underneath the carburetor because that spacer has the provisions for the vacuum lines that we that we run to various things. To to um, we run a pressure sensor from the discharge hat above the carburetor. We run a boost reference from there going to the regulators, so that the fuel pressure rises with every pound of boost. 
So we always have a delta of seven PSI fuel to make sure we have fuel flow going into the carburetor when, we're, when we have boosts going through the carburetor. So that works well. And then also so that we can, if we want to boost reference the, the um, or, or take boost readings, I should say, boost reference or dyno gauge, um, we can do that as well. So it's good to monitor that stuff. Um, then one of the things that we did is I put, uh, we, we did an intercooler test, but we didn't do the intercooler test until I did a cylinder head test. So what we did was because I wanted to see how much power the cylinder head was worth both NA and supercharge. What I did was we took the Vortec off. Then we installed a set of Brodex aluminum heads on this thing in, pl in place of the stock Gen 6 heads. Now, one of the things about the Brodex heads is that while they did flow more than the stock head, they, they, did, they definitely offered a power gain, but there was a dramatic change in in compression ratio because they had a much bigger chamber. We went from like 102 to 119 or 120 cc's. So it was a big change. It dropped the compression, but it added more flow. And so you might be asking yourself, well, which one of the, which one of those outweighed the other? Did it did it lose power because it lost compression? Did it gain power because it added airflow? Was there a trade-off somewhere? And the answer is in the middle, it, there was a trade-off. It did make more peak power. Peak power went from 427 to 450. Torque dropped to 459 foot-pounds. In fact, it lost power down low and then gained power up the top. Kind of like what you see when we go to a single plane, dual plane, or when we go to a camshaft that's a trade-off kind of camshaft compared to some sort of stock cam that does very well down low. So similar kind of thing. So we lost compression, but it would give us the opportunity, especially in this case, it would give us the opportunity to run. Um, we could we could have run all this on pump gas, but we we didn't. <laughs> we ran it. We ran it with a mixture of 91 and 100, just so that we could run timing and and what seemed like an awful lot of boost on this thing. So then, what we did was with the. Um, do we go over the? Let me see here. I don't. I don't want to get in my get ahead of myself here. So we got non intercooled, and then intercooled. Okay, so we did install um, an air to water intercooler with the stock heads before doing the head swap. So I made a mistake there. We did install that. So it, it, with the intercooler, it went from 791 horsepower to 847 horsepower. So we gained, uh, what is that? 56 horsepower from the intercooler with still using a blow through carburetor. So that worked well. And it did drop the boost a little bit from 19 pounds to 17.7 pounds. Then what we did was we put the Brodex heads on, we gained horsepower NA, and then we ran the Brodex combination with the blow through carburetor, with the intercooler and with the Vortec. So, and, and we picked up power. So with the with that setup and the stock head, it made 847 horsepower. But with that setup, we didn't change the pulleys or anything. But with that setup and the Brodex head, the aluminum heads, it made 904 horsepower. So we picked up almost 60 horsepower from the head swap under boost. And still the intercooler worked well <laughs> and, and the blow through carburetor worked well. All of that stuff worked well. So we got a lot of test data here. And it shows that, you know, while, while we would want one thing to override the other, when you're looking at more airflow versus compression, both of them are important. And in our case, the compression was a little more important down low. And, and that stands as a reason because the stock had, had enough airflow to support the lower RPM power levels. So all we did was lose when we went to a lower compression. That's pretty normal. You, when you change the static compression, you change the power output by three to 4% per one full point of compression. And we changed it by that much. So that might be, you know, 12, anywhere from 15 or to 18 foot pounds of torque down there. So it, it could be quite a bit. And that's hard to make up from additional airflow, especially in the lower lift ranges and the, and the lower RPM ranges, because the cylinder heads have enough flow to support that down there. Stock heads do. But we did gain up top because we had more airflow. The head was better than the than the Gen 6 head. And despite the fact that it lost that percentage of compression, 
it gained that in airflow. So if we would have had both, we would have seen an, an even greater gain. I don't know that we could have milled these heads down to 102 cc's. <laughs> that that have been some serious angle milling um, to try to get that to happen. And I just don't think that we could go. I don't think we could go down from 120 down to 102. That would be a lot. Maybe we could split the difference and that would help, but we couldn't get all the way down there. And that's one of the benefits that those stock Gen 6 heads have is they have really small combustion chambers. That's why they're a good upgrade. Take a set of Gen 5 heads off, put the Gen 6 heads on, and you got a big change in static compression. And the Gen 5 heads are, or the Gen 5 motors are notoriously low compression anyway. So you've got a lot of room to grow there. And then we saw an even greater gain when we were comparing it under boost. So we picked up more power under boost with the aluminum heads, plus the aluminum heads, like we said, lower compression, you know, boost friendly compression, plus they're aluminum. So the, the, they give us more of a tuning window, you know, for harmful detonation. All of that stuff is good. The bigger chamber lowered the boost pressure from 17.7 pounds to 16.5 pounds. We dropped another pound of boost out of it. So it, it just was all around better. So, so the moral of this story is if you're putting together a big block, aluminum heads are a good idea. Boost is a good idea. Intercooler obviously is a good idea. And a blow through carburetor, obviously also a good idea. So let's see what I got to get a poll up here. Okay, would you run a junkyard Gen 6 454 big block Chevy at 19 pounds with the stock heads? Does that sound like a good idea? Of course, of course it does, right? <laughs> so let's see what you guys got going on. Tim, Shadow Ops, uh, single overhead cam, Tony. Jesse, Winston, greetings, everyone. Iron heads are the best because they're heavy enough for a boat anchor. <laughs> These definitely were. Any chance we could see a Cooper... Spaghetti interview from you in the future. I don't even know who that is. So you'll have to tell me who that is. Green bass boots used in heavy duty applications for sure. We tried using a, an iron cylinder head actually as a boat anchor in my buddy's, um, I think it was a 17 foot Chris Craft. We, we used to go out and ski behind it. It was a little um, 3.8 liter V6. And we used to go out by the Queen Mary and stuff and, and go water skiing out there and go in Stingray Bay and stuff. But we'd also use it. We'd go out fishing and use it. And it doesn't, and, and actually, a, a, even though it's a big, heavy iron thing, it doesn't really work very well. It just drags the bottom. And so the tide will actually drag that thing around. It, it needs some kind of hook to stick in. So <laughs> iron heads don't actually make very good anchors because I've dyno tested that. Hey, everybody's in the house. Howdy, right up that right up my alley. Gen 6 with factory iron heads, getting single plane high rise, 850 holly, lots of nitrous, and a comp 421 can with adjustable rockers. Uh, Bob, I would be surprised if the single plane was the best choice there. I think you'll want a dual plane because I don't think you could put enough camshaft in it to where the single plane starts doing better than the dual plane with that kind of combination. I tried cleaning the Gen 3 M90 rotors, stripped the rotor coating off with something, soap, water, and a toothbrush. Why, why did you want to clean the rotors? You should leave all that stuff on there because that's what gives you the boost. Car wash soap. There we go. Fast media really clean steel. Don't blast chrome though. Then replate the steel with cadmium or other heat resistance, anti corrosive. I don't know that you want to do that to the rotors. Air to water intercooler twin charge setup I wanted is unfortunately above my budget, but I can substitute the air to water intercooler by running methanol and go still E and the air to water intercooler, but methanol could get me running sooner. Okay. Methanol is going to be more expensive to run, though, right? Let's 
Shadow Ops, your, your pooch is doing better, your doggy. Interesting how the torque was dropped. Do you believe a cam and springs might have helped? I, I don't know what you're talking about. If you're talking about the big block, the, the loss in torque was from the change in compression. Just tuning in. Did it end up being the tack wasn't seated all the way? On, is that from our previous discussion? Tracy, welcome. Taylor's in the house. Your dog ate a t-shirt tag? My dogs like to eat socks, like whole socks. They chew up the whole thing, and then they have to throw them back up. Or uh, one of them found a shop rag today, and I don't know where he got that, because all of those are in, in the garage. I wish somebody could donate a 632 Chevy to you, Camaro LT1. My dehydrated Silverado lives. It's just a 5.3 shadow. So is it is it driving, Taylor? We heard you that you got it. Didn't you get it started? It's hard to find enough big pieces of sandpaper to resurface a cylinder head. Anybody have any suggestions? I've seen guys do it on a big revolving sanding table. Gen 5 pistons are no good. Yeah, I, I agree. And I'm scrolling back. Hard enough to find big, big enough pieces of sandpaper to surface a head. I've I've done that on a Honda head before. Uh, we did it on the actually not on the head. We did it on the on the deck. Part of the sleeve was sticking up for some reason after we ran lots of boost on it on a roots blower too, which was awful. Oh, I would when I'm boosting my 300,000 mile 4.3 with nothing else touched. Untouched. <laughs> Coyote guys are famous for that. Cletus McFarland's buddy is Cooper. What do, Should I know him for, for something? Has he, somebody tell me what he's done. I'm, I'm sure he's like way famous, but I just, I don't recognize the name. I've done lots of um, surfacing with um, like the Scotch Bright wheels and stuff. It all works fine. If I had a 454, I wouldn't be concerned with having more. That would be enough. Just any 454. There's lots of them in the wrecking yard. Cooper had the 2JZ Catfish Camaro. Richie, when can I buy your Super Richie M90 plate? Tom Demuse has those already. Tom De from Demuse Engineering, he has those available. Yeah, Tall Garage. I saw that. I some or somebody had mentioned it yesterday that Calvin got his his rig stolen. A Gen Five makes two hundred thirty horsepower. Yeah, they're not super stellar. When we run them on the engine dyno, a Gen Five. If we take the TBI stuff off and put a carburetor and an intake manifold. They make like anywhere from 310 to 330. Cooper is a Florida YouTuber and drag racer who started interviewing people in drag racing and car industry school. I would like to, I've always wanted to do more interviews. How's our poll doing? 60% are saying yes, they would. 40% saying no. You need a roll of four inch sticky sandpaper and a straight block of steel for resurfacing.
Yeah, 454 does make a good towing one, Mark. Big blocks are nice for towing. The rotor coating of the M90 is a mystery. The other two blowers I'm parting out, I definitely know it didn't clean the rotors. And see, I was wondering about that after we got the ported one. Um, I just put the rotor pack in the way that it was. And it has a lot of carbon buildup on it. But I just figure the carbon buildup, because like I wanted it to be clean. <laughs> I was half tempted to do that. But I knew that the carbon buildup is in, a, is in an area where it's not, where the rotors are not touching. So that tells me it needs to build up there. <laughs> to, although maybe it takes away volume for the rotors when they're moving together. I don't really know. Been messing with the big block Chevy since 67. This is a great show. They love 116 octane. Certainly the older stuff does, uh, Kurt, the older high compression stuff does. A Gen 5 uh, or a Gen 6 at <laughs> like 7 or 8 to 1, they don't really care about gas. Were you able to see the eclipse? I, I walked outside, but I, I didn't really look at it. Let's see. Opening up the pockets on a Gen 6 is a losing proposition. Taking out the swirl doesn't help low RPM and helps higher RPM just a little. So are you talking about porting the head on it? The cam is a 236, 242. That's pretty good size. Can you please manufacture a less expensive air to water intake for LS guys? What do you mean by that? Uh, an air to water intercooler? That's that's incorporated into the manifold. What's the difference between a MAF and a MAP sensor? There's a dramatic difference. A MAP sensor is really only registering pressure, but uh, mass airflow um, measures, depending on which one it is, um, measures mass flow. So it measures um, temperature and volume, both, I think. Oh, so Shadow Ops, you're wondering if we get rid of the cam that we had just put in it and go back to a different cam, if we could get that torque back from the loss in compression. But it's always going to be, it's always going to be less with lower compression. And if we go down smaller in the camshaft, we're going to lose power. As for the methanol statement, running methanol is still going to be cheaper than fabricated in air to water air to water manifold both allow me to make more than enough power to turn my Subaru five speed into beach sand. <laughs> yeah. But intercoolers are inexpensive. I mean, you can buy air to air intercoolers or even air to water intercoolers. I mean, they're, they're like a couple hundred dollars. Yeah. Gary, let us know if you're, if you have, airflow data on porting the Gen 6 heads. I'm curious to see what, what they'll do. I don't, I don't think a map sensor measures pressure. I mean, it doesn't measure density. It just measures pressure. In my opinion, Gen 6 is a trailer or heavy load engine. Not much good for anything else. We've made lots of stuff that's over a thousand horsepower with them. Completely cloudy here, so no eclipse. I saw, um, I saw that in a couple of areas. Uh, my neighbor has some uh, relatives of hers that that flew to Texas to see it, and it was wherever they went, it was cloudy, and they didn't get to see it. Can we see the thirty eight hundred with a with a ported M ninety? Uh, I guess we could. We're going to see um, what we'll see is a lot higher boost level because it's not as powerful of an NA motor. Have I done that with multi-layer steel gasket engines? LS motors I have, yeah. 
I don't know about, I don't, Mark, I don't know how warped your head is. Are there any drop in pistons for Gen 6s? Would be nice to drop in some dome pistons and open up the cam and head choices. Yeah, I'm sure that they do because it's a, I, I'm sure that's got to be a standard compression height piston. What was the torque from a Gen 5? I can look it up if you want to know. I've run I've run some Gen 5 stuff. Big block Chevy results. 454. Gen 6, Gen 6, uh, Gen 5, Junkyard. Three hundred and thirty-four horsepower and four hundred and forty-seven foot-pounds of torque. And this was a Gen Five with a seven fifty Holley, a Wyan dual plane, dyno headers, and nineteen ninety-two TBI long block Gen Five. How much exhaust back pressure is normal? How many PSI back pressure you'd consider upgrading and modifying your exhaust? Well, it depends on what you're doing. So Saul, if you're trying to make the most power that you can, the, the exhaust after the turbo needs to be as big as it can be. So most of the things that we would do are normally at least three and a half or four inches. So sometimes even bigger than that, depending on what turbo we're hooking it to. So the, but a lot of times the back pressure is going to be more a function of the, because you have to really restrict the exhaust after the turbo to get big changes in back pressure reading between the cylinder head and the turbo. So a lot of times the back pressure there is a function of the NA power output and the displacement of the motor versus the size turbo that you're trying to use. So a good example is, is when we put the 454, uh, we put that on the dyno and then ran it with a GT45. So it was just like a cam 454 and ran the GT45 turbo. Very responsive, <laughs> but also very, very high back pressure. So three to one um, in terms of back pressure versus boost pressure, boost pressure, because that turbo just is not the hot side of that turbo is just not big enough. So, and we just ran a three inch exhaust or something out, out of it, whatever the size of the exit of that GT45 is three or three and a half. So you have to be, you have to be concerned about that. And then also about the exhaust size after the turbo, but it's not unusual for a lot of turbo things to be two to one, three to one is getting to be a lot. Run all things with 19 pounds. That's, that's your advice. Mdo. Uh, I've messed with big block Chevy since 1976, hundreds of them. That's a lot. It takes a good engine man to make them reach their potential. I'm not sure I understand that statement. I'm scrolling back. Scrolling and scrolling. I want to get a piece of granite. Yeah, that should be smooth, like a countertop scrap. That and sandpaper being big enough to do the entire head and deck. You want to run T, you want to run two M90s on a 454? I, I would have no problem running one gen 5 m90 and certainly in modified form on a 454 on a stock 454 that makes 375 horsepower putting a blower on it is easily going to add another 100 horsepower and 100 foot pounds of torque even without doing anything to the blower i mean we're gonna have to change the pulley but i it would that would work fine the way the rotor coating came off is a little scary it all lifted at once in big sheets <laughs> that's not good you got to see it through glasses. That is cool. I've seen some photos of it, but I didn't get to see it myself. 
No codes. Am I allowed to ask why this LC9 is burning through oil like I'm an oil supplier? Yet yeah, you're allowed to ask whatever question you want. Is it a is it a used motor? Is it a new one? What's the deal with it? If it's burning oil, that's usually rings or um, guides or seals. How can all these guys, these coyotes run a decent amount of boost at 12 to 1 compression on pump gas, but the LS requires E85? So guys are running 12 to 1 on pump gas with boost on it? Everything I've read said the carbon helps seal the rotors. I wanted to inspect the condition of the coating. Yeah, I know that coating them is one of the things that the OEMs do to help them seal. Um, I had a conversation with Jim Bell about this, and and that's that's one of the first things to go. That coating starts to go when you run these things fast and at high boost. So when you run a lot of rotor speed and a lot of um, temperature and a lot of pressure, the that coating starts to go, and when the coating starts to go, the rotors are right behind that. <laughs> Gen 6 is a good engine with other heads. Even Flowtech has a major improvement. Valve seals, guides, bad PCV system, gummed up oil ring, fuel dilution in the oil are things to look at when burning oil. Speaking of the M90 stuff, I see you use a long runner on the dyno and use a short runner on that truck. The short runner clear pretty well. Yeah, the, that's why we that's why I did it in the truck. I didn't know if the high ram and the blower would clear the hood, but the adapter works because it just bolts to the high ram uh, or, or that bolt pattern. So the high ram and the low ram share that same bolt pattern. Yes, that's a thing. Integrated intake manifold, air to water. Someone needs to make a reasonably priced one. Yeah, <laughs> you don't know what you're asking. That's gonna, that's not going to be a, a, an inexpensive deal. And it, and it doesn't need to be integrated. It can be a multi-piece deal like a, like a high ram and then a an intercooler core and then another adapter. You can always run a remote positive displacement blower. Yep, you can do that. Todd, your block is good. Which one, the LS3 or the LS2? Thinking of replacing stock intake and throttle body with TBS, TBSS. But also before I buy a new intercooler while I'm on the topic, is there a sensor or something near 6L80 not allowing my cooler to even work? Not allowing your transmission cooler to work? A few runs of pipe through an igloo cooler, a big one packed with ice will get you intercooled. I'm having the crank polished. I'm going to reassemble. Uh, Todd, make sure you check ring gap on that. Did you do that already? I'm building a Pro Charge 555. What compression and piston would you suggest? It depends on what your goals are and what your what um, fuel you're going to be running this thing on and what you're going to be using it for. I like to put stuff together that's around 10 to 1. Um, only because that way it makes decent power NA, and then also I can run boost on it, especially if we put E85 or a good kind of fuel in it. It's not all in on the NA side. Like it's not 15 to 1 NA deal where you shouldn't run boost on it. And it's also not 8 to 1 where you could you should only run boost on it and not run it NA. We've run a lot of those, but but you get the idea. You get You just get more power. And the that middle kind of compression area still gives you a window where, where you can run stuff on. So it depends on what you're trying to do. If it's if it's a drag race thing, then you run all the compression that you can and run lots of octane and combine compression and boost and that kind of stuff. Somebody else needs to get the ads. I think more than you, Eric, I don't think you're the only one. Slat 6 can make massive horsepower with boost. You, you really think so? I 
It's not obviously warped. I'm just assuming because it blew a head gasket. That doesn't always mean sometimes the head gasket is the, is the, although usually on an MLS, usually something bad happens to the head because the MLS head gaskets are pretty tough. So if you hurt those, you probably hurt something else, but you can also always put a straight edge on it and check it. A straight edge and a fueler gauge. If you have a real straight edge, a straight edge and a fueler gauge will give you a really good idea if it's warped. Richard Dino, the Bob patented big inner core. I, I want to see what he's talking about for tubes running through the, like I can envision an, uh, an igloo with ice in it, but I don't know what the tubes are going to look like. Because if they're just big three inch tubes, it's not going to do anything. It's not going to, it's going to have hardly any cooling at all. I'd like to see the M90 on a bone stock 5.3 for comparison. Wh which M90? The uh, A stock one? That's kind of what I was going to run on mine. Mine was all stock, and I was even going to run the the Gen 3 M90 on mine because I know that it would add 100 horsepower to that. I've not spoken to the machine shop. Uh-oh, that, that's not good for a son to be like that. Running Dart 338 heads and part matched intake. Those are good heads. I like the Dart Pro one stuff. I need some K2500 OBS long tube headers. Anybody out there can hook Bob up. Richard, can you explain hydrolock and what damage it could cause to an engine? Well, it can it can really break everything in the motor. So hydrolock is just when you ingest water in and the piston comes up and since water is not compressible the piston comes up to up up toward tdc depending on how much water you have in there and stops immediately so what happens is usually a rod will break but a piston can break you can push the head gasket out you can lift the head um you're you're going to damage the least strongest thing and this happens like in the blink of an eye um so it, it, less than that um so rods we've bent we've bent rods doing that like just try just on the starter trying to start it one time with water that got in there and it bent a rod i can't drink all day if you start in the morning that's right pump gas pro street The, the thing about having a 555 is even if you ran it at eight to one and drove it around on pump gas with boost on it, it, it would, it's going to make more than enough power. <laughs> Rental car prices went ridiculous for the Eclipse, $1,100 for, for $78. Yeah, I don't think I would want that. I, I know that one, at least one of the airlines scheduled flights so that you could be in the air to see the eclipse so that you could see it and and you'd definitely be above the clouds so that you could see the eclipse which would kind of be cool scrolling 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 Man, I'm uh, pro, pro pump gas pro street. Uh, Dave, are you running a blower on it? And if you want a cam recommendation, I've built a lot of 555s and 565 big blocks. I have a bunch of them up on the channel. You can look and see what kind of power you want to make based on what those are. 408 Super Victor LS3 heads. Uh, unfortunately, the lift in the LSA don't really tell me anything about the camshaft. Um, I need. I would need to know. I would need to know what the duration of the camshaft is. Why do I do I not notice a change in horsepower going from a full two and a half inch exhaust to a three inch cutout right after my GT45? Could it be that the two and a half inch exhaust is enough flow for the power that you're making? A two and a half inch exhaust, a, is it a dual two and a half? A single two and a half going to a three inch? On a GT35 should definitely add power unless you have a restriction somewhere else. T 
Tony, you've been binging David Vizard's videos. I definitely do not have a hand <laughs> on experience to comprehend most of what he's saying. He he is he is out there sometimes. I, I like David a lot. He he's done a lot of cool stuff. M90 on my Chrysler 2.7 is almost done. Very cool. My other mods are BBK 90 millimeter throttle body. It will like that as long as the entry is also 90 millimeters. It'll brock 36 pound injectors, milling high, high flow oil pump, and you want 10 PSI. Just put a hub on the blower and you have adjustable pulleys to make that happen. Took the heads off my Magnum, saw that they were cracked. Should I replace them? Probably so. I've run a lot of cracked heads and not had any problems with that. But again, we run stuff on the dyno and if something goes wrong and I can fix it, it's easy to fix on the dyno. If it's in the car driving around and you're stuck somewhere, that's kind of a bigger deal. KC Max turn tri-wise into turbo manifolds, finding them more efficient with a crazy sound. So my question for you is, so when somebody makes a statement that says that they made them more efficient, I want to see the data that shows that they're more efficient. I want to see a direct comparison between that and something else, run at the same boost, the same temperature and the same air fuel and the same timing where something got better. Like I want that to happen, but Somebody just telling me that it's more efficient is not, and I'm not pointing at you. I'm just saying if when I'm out there talking to people and somebody tells me this is better, I, I'm, my mind immediately goes, okay, well, let's see. I want to show me, show me how it's better. What, what was it before? And then what was it after and what made it better? And what are we attributing that to? I want, I want the data. I bent rods in my Gen 453, the piston skirt touches the, Crank counterweight, that's not good. Someone hydrolocked it before I bought it. Oh, so you bent the rod and shortened it, and then that caused a problem with um, piston to crank clearance? Would be funny to see the baby M90 on a big block. I, I need to do that. And the, the cool thing about the Gen 6, if I use the factory EFI, which now I've thrown, I've thrown away a dozen of those, I'm sure. Um, I shouldn't have because they have a removable lid and that makes it perfect for a, for a, for an adapter plate. I have a heads cam intake Vortec V1 Fox body, non intercooled running 10, 11 pounds. When do you typically start retarding timing in relation to air temp? Of course, it depends on initial timing pump 91. Yeah. Uh, how much timing are you already taking away running on pump 91? It should be. Should be a pretty fair bit. What type of food is California known for? I don't know that a state is known for that. But yeah, they, there's really good Mexican food, especially as obviously as we get down south near the border. Some of the best Italian places I've been to are here. Tomorrow is cleaning the block day, hone and assemble. Stock Gen 3 Coyotes, 12 to 1. They put a blower on it, runs 12 to 15 pounds on pump gas. So it's direct injected, which is a big thing for uh, managing detonation. And they run factory knock sensors on them, which take away a bunch of timing. So you're going to do the LS2 again, Todd? What's the most you'll pay for a junkyard LS? I I won't pay more than I I don't know, four or five hundred dollars probably. Magnum heads crack between the valves. That's where the seven oh six heads do too, and and the thirty eight hundreds were like that. We just got a C four Corvette with an L ninety eight tune port in the house. Looking at, there's no wonder it only makes two hundred and forty five horsepower. Yep. Just pick up a 96 Gen 6 for my 55 Chevy project. That's that's a good application for that. Let's spend your experience with core shift on these blocks. I'm wondering how far the block can be bored. A 25. 
Stroker is playing. On, on a 454, we normally go to, you'd make it into a 496. So you would bore it and then put a, um, a um, what is it, a 4250 stroke crank in it? 10.5 safe on 91 pump gas, yes. Nitrous jets make an intercooled intake. They don't work very well for intercooling, actually. There's just not enough nitrous to make a difference in temperature. They are between the valves. I'm doing a turbo build, so I'm just going to replace them. It shouldn't be too hard to find another set of magnum heads, right? Look for the data sheet, but I know the Gen 6 was less than 240 CFM. I that would probably be where I would think it would be. We only got 260. Okay. Coyotes are just two Honda K24s put together. Yeah, that would be nice. I had to rebuild the boat due to hydrolocking. If I remember right, pretty sure it was a carb float. Yeah, you can fill the thing with fuel, certainly. The industrial turbo and nitrous slant six at PR is running low nines and a full body Valiant. Yeah, a, a, a lightweight car and a, and a full dedicated build and stuff. It's just that the, the thing is, and the thing that I like to point out when people use these extreme examples is that that's not indicative of what the slant sixes are that are running around, even turbocharged ones, because the slant six doesn't make very good NA power. Um, none of the ones I've seen are, are very powerful. And then, so if you have a 150 or 200 horsepower motor and you're turbocharged it and you make 400, it's just not, that's not a lot. Please save a cam for me. Yep, I've got cams. That's not a problem. Had a 9454SS truck. I really like those. The guys from Arizona Speed Marine used to bring them out to the Silver State. Open element can in. Had a detail. When finished it, it would not start. It hydrolocked. <laughs> Tried to clean the air filter with a pressure washer. Yep, that's not good. So you're just going to run two and a half inch tubing through a bob and fill it full of ice. If you do that, if somebody does that, please make sure to measure the charge temperature. There's a hole in the cylinder wall dumping water into the cylinder. That's also bad. I, I have shipped out the first batch of cams and the next, all the rest of the ones that are ordered will go out this week. On a none other note, are the circumstances for activating VVT typically the same as activating VTEC? No, VVT is not normally, it was early on, BMW had a, a VVT system that was just RPM specific and it, and it only went from, there, there was no intermediate. It went from one amount of advance or one amount of retard to another one. And it was just a switch thing like VTEC is. Most of them uh, vary greatly and, and at all kinds of RPM ranges and load and throttle angles. That's really where it does most of its work. It mo does most of its work at start and cruise and uh, throttle transitions and stuff. And wide open throttle, you're only sweeping it by between seven and nine degrees normally, not very much. 
And and that would be a run from, you know, 2,500 to 6,500 or 7,000 or whatever the number is. You're not, you're not retarding the camshaft very much. So it's not, it's not a big change, but they're doing it gradually and not all at once, not at one point. Like VTEC goes from one cam to another cam and the switchover point is the optimum point where you don't get a big drop or a big rise in power where the transition is smooth. Mexican and Italian are the two best cuisines. I, they're kind of my favorites, although I, you know, <laughs> a really good steak is also awesome. And lobster. Yeah, all of that stuff is shadow ops. All that stuff is good. It's a big state. It varies, but I've noticed the breakfast menus can be interesting in some spots. M90 on a 2.2. How do you know if it's a Gen 5 or... A Gen 5 or a Gen 6 are, are dramatically different. The Gen 6 is um, the easy way to identify it is the fact that it is port fuel injected on a Gen 6. You can't see the hydraulic roller cam, but it has a distinct intake manifold and it has individual um, injectors for each cylinder. A Gen 5 is going to be throttle body injected, so it's easy to tell that one. The best steak I had was at Willie G's on Galveston Island. Yeah, Roos Chris is pretty good, and um, Fleming's, I think, was another good one. Next time you're in the yards, look at Magnuson's try to find a set of heads without freeze plugs in the end. They'll be aftermarket UQ, UQ heads. Oh, that's a good idea, Aaron. I'll, I'll have to check that out. What cranks do you use when building 496s? There's lots of um, 4250 stroke cranks. Um, Scat has them. Lenati has them. We know, a lot of times I don't even run steel ones. We just run cast ones because again, we're not going to break a crank for what we're doing. <laughs> Eric, I had them send all the ads to your house. I can measure charge temperature with a point shooter. You can't, you can't measure charge temperature with an infrared gun pointing at an intake tube. That doesn't work. You don't have to take the intake off to tell what motor it is. You can, the air intake maybe, but not the intake manifold. Burgers are awesome. And pizza, of course, that's, that's kind of Italian. Yeah, that sounds like a good idea, Mark. So you're going to use it for the um, repurpose the VVT outlet or, or the output for VTEC. That'll, go, that'll be good. Tim's all in on the pizza. Two slices too, man. Mel's here in Sacramento. Uh, is that Mel's Diner, um, Todd? Or is that another Mel's? Melly Mel. What about the Mark IVs? Mark IVs are fine too. The the Mark IVs will not be throttle body injected, and they may. And then the other thing to look at is on the Gen Four and Gen Five. Most of the Gen Fives do not have um, uh, fuel pump provisions. The, none of the Gen Sixes do. The Gen Fives, I think, went away from that. The Gen Fours are all going to have fuel pump provisions. And then the the front covers are also different. Pizza, pizza. 496 crank shares the LS1 firing order. Mass data should lead to air charge temperature. Yes, they're, they they are measuring uh, mass. Mass flow means they're measuring density, and that is temperature. I'm talking cooler, intercooler. Sorry, best I can do, working with what I got. <laughs> no, no, I, I want you to do it. I definitely do. No mechanical fuel pump like the small black Chevy TBI engines. Yeah, the blocks didn't have the provisions for them. 
because they weren't ever going to use them. That's that's for some people on some big black guys, lots of big black guys or carbureted big black guys, um, <laughs> fry burger. And so they don't like the later blocks that don't have mechanical fuel pumps. Oh, you gotta, I'm running a carburetor. You got to have a mechanical fuel pump. Well, you can run an electric fuel pump to a carburetor also and regulate it. Do I need anything to connect a six liter to my 700 R4? Uh, does anybody know? It, I mean, the is your 700 R4 bell housing designed for a small block Chevy? The the bell housing should bolt up. It's going to be missing at least one of the bolt holes, but that's okay. You just need to get the spacing right for the torque converter to the to the flex plate. Although they have flex plate uh, flex plates that have the right spacing to make that work now. Wish I could tune my three V for the cold air kit I have for it. Yep. Not Mel's Diner, Morton's. Yeah, Morton's is good, is a good steakhouse too. I've eaten there before. Uh, the TBI engines have the shape. Yeah, the it looks like the flange is there, um, but they're not drilled for it, right? Torque converter spacer. Thinking of it seriously now. My turbo's going in the bed. Just have to have a cooler sitting in the back next to it. Just going for a picnic. You can actually see a roller cam hydraulic lifter dog bones on a 454 gen with the oil cap removed. Shine a flashlight down. Okay, that's interesting. I, I don't, I've never looked down there. <laughs> and again, Gary said he spent a lot of time porting them. <laughs> it gets frustrating. I understand that. And my hat's off to you spending that kind of time on iron heads too. And heavy iron heads too, because that's none of that sounds fun. And then to not get results is even worse. The time maps I see guys running on boosted motors. It's amazing. It's amazing that they last beyond five PSI. Base tunes are keeping the aftermarket rod companies profitable. Yeah, because the guys think that, hey, look, it started up. It sounds good. Yes, it sounds really happy. It sounds really happy with NA timing right up until it doesn't. We got two more minutes. We got 65% saying yes on the 19 with their iron-headed big block. The Gen 6 Siamese blocks are so much stronger than Gen 4s. You can run Gen 4 heads and cam in them. The, and all of the Gen 6 motors, and I think all the Gen 5 motors, are all 4-bolt mains too. So, you know, all of the Mark 4s are not. I was told the 46 RE transmissions are junk beyond 500 horsepower. I don't, I think that there are kits to mount a turbo 400, but I don't know anything about that, that Dodge transmission. I'm not Dodge transmission savvy. John, you made it just in time for me to leave because you got about like 45 seconds. Yep. Four bolt mains. I have a sketchy question. Can I swap a Gen 3 crank and a Gen 4 engine without having it rebalanced? I've heard guys doing it. It will be out of balance. They will, they will not be the same. You're going to have to swap the um, reluctor wheels too, unless you plan on using a different reluctor wheel. Because the Gen 4 is going to be a 58X and the Gen 3 is going to be a 24. And the wheels themselves are going to be have different weights. Brother and I both picked up 67 Mustangs this week. Nice. Todd, let me know after you talk to your guy about the head situation and the valves and springs and stuff. What's the best EFI intake for a Gen 6? I don't know. Um, they, I know that they have like Victor Juniors that are converted for EFI. 
And I've seen some of the tunnel Rammy kind of things. I think Arizona Speed Marine used to have some. But I haven't seen, I thought that Holly was going to come out with a high ram for them, but I haven't seen it. He must be really strong to pick up a 67 Mustang. <sighs> Got those uncle jokes. So, Bob, I'm happy we could help, man. Let, I want to see a photo. You better send me a photo of that, of your <laughs> igloo intercooler. Toyotas with lawnmower engines. That's all. All of that's good. There's, there's no, there's no bad answer there. Can't the Gen Five Six big block get MPFI or are they mainly Holly TBI setups? No, all of the Gen Six is multi-port. They all have individual um, injectors, one for each hole. And we ran it. We have run it with a Holly, but the TBI stuff is different. Mm -hmm. And on that note, it's time to go, but I will see you guys all tomorrow.